seconds. Good afternoon. My name is Terry Casey. I'm chairman of the State Board of Personnel Review, and my iPhone says it's exactly one o'clock, and we want to be timely and prompt. And I want to welcome you to this program on Civil Service uh, 101, tips, questions, ideas, comments, et cetera. And for background, the State Board of Personnel Review mainly deals mostly under the state law with county, state, and university employees, but one important section says that four municipalities and civil service commissions were somewhat like the Court of Appeals in that we occasionally get cases that come in uh, where there's things involved. So uh, we get some occasionally some interesting questions and answers, but one of our responsibilities is also to share information and background. And one item that's important to understand is that civil service in Ohio is something that has a great connection to the state and is very important. If you remember your history, there was a president named Garfield who was unfortunately assassinated by a disgruntled office seeker. And that resulted in a senator by the name of Pendleton, who happened to be from Ohio in the Cincinnati area that passed the Pendleton Act. And what the federal government did in the late 1880s or 90s to do away with the Jacksonian to the victors belong the spoils resulted in civil service. And one of the interesting things is civil service is actually spoken to in the Ohio Constitution. So it isn't just the state law, it's the Constitution. And of course, what are the issues that might come up? And if you do get a little confused on Ohio law and civil service, it's not you. It's part of the nature of the beast because sometimes the legislature passes different laws at different times. Sometimes they mesh perfectly. Sometimes it takes Supreme Court decisions or District Court of Appeals decisions to clarify it. And one example of a case that we had recently was a Marietta police chief case where I think in that community, they were trying to do the right thing, uh, but they didn't quite do it exactly right. And uh, a complaint came into our board and we handled it appropriately and Marietta got the situation corrected and things move on. But again, if it seems like the law occasionally is confusing, that's because sometimes it is a little bit. That's one of the reasons why it's very good. If you're on a civil service commission, you're a municipal official, to ask your law director, city attorney, whatever the position might be, to clarify, because it's always better to ask before you leap instead of going back and trying to fix it, because if you didn't do it right, you got to fix it. Sometimes those back pay issues get expensive and confusing. And one other factor that makes Ohio interesting is that Ohio is a big and diverse state. We've got a lot of municipalities in the eight to 20,000 range. We've obviously got bigger cities like Columbus, Cleveland, and Cincinnati that have bigger law departments, bigger civil service departments, but one size under law kind of fits every part of Ohio but sometimes it's harder to apply, particularly if certain cases don't come up. And one important point is don't be shy. Uh, and by the way, we're now up to 215 people signed on, which is very good. We appreciate everybody tuning in, but don't be shy about posting any questions and try and keep the questions fairly general because we can't get into a five minute thing on every detail of every case. Uh, but again, don't be shy in terms of your questions or following up later to ask because in many cases our skilled staff might be able to follow up uh, appropriately. So the first thing I'd like to do is turn it over to Jeanette and Ray who are both administrative law judges. I think you see their pictures on the screen and they're both very skilled and experienced and they're going to give you a little bit of a 101 primer that's live on tape, we'll kind of do like the night comedy shows do, live on tape, but then they'll deal with some questions that come up and then we've got some other skilled speakers from the municipalities uh, in Ohio. And again, we encourage questions and uh, we'll turn it over to uh, Jeanette and Ray on the video segment and then them live. All right, thanks so much. Um, appreciate the introduction, Terry. For all of you that are out there, it looks like we're up to two, almost 230 now. When we looked at the registration for the folks who were joining us today, 
we noticed that we had a, a good mix of people. We had some people that are seasoned veterans who've been doing the whole civil service thing for some time now, and we had some folks that were brand new. So we sent a questionnaire kind of thing to you guys to say what it was that you wanted us to talk about. Two of the general topics that came up were the history of civil service and just some basic things for new members, basic questions that they had. So we did our best to combine those into a presentation for you. Hopefully we'll hit at least the high points. And then as Terry said, there's also an opportunity for you all to submit any questions that you have. And we'll look forward to those and to getting into some nuts and bolts with you toward the end of the presentation. So with that, I guess, Justin, go ahead and roll that presentation. civil service? Where did it all start and where is it going? What's my role as a member of a municipal civil service commission? When someone says they are a civil service employee or a civil servant, it means that the person works for a government agency, whether it is federal, state, or local. Civil service employees are hired rather than elected, and their institutional tenure typically survives transitions of political leadership. Civil servants are usually selected and promoted on the basis of merit and seniority. The origin of today's modern civil service system can be traced all the way back to Imperial China. The Imperial examination, based on merit, was designed to select the best administrative officials for the state's bureaucracy. Appointments to the bureaucracy were traditionally based on the patronage of aristocrats. But the merit-based system was not dependent on a candidate's political connections or family pedigree. During the 18th century, in response to population growth, urbanization, and economic changes, institutional bureaucracy began to greatly expand. In general, government positions were filled at that time through patronage or outright purchase of an appointment. Appointees were generally qualified to do their jobs, but were taken from the exclusive world of the political and wealthy elite. In 1796, the British East India Company coined the term civil service and introduced training and examinations for the administrators overseeing its territories in India. In 1855, Britain introduced its own politically neutral civil service. Architects of the plan recommended that recruitment should be based on merit determined through competitive examination, that recruits should be graded into a hierarchy, and that promotion should be through achievement rather than preferment, patronage, or purchase. They also recommended a clear division between staff responsible for routine work and those engaged in policy formulation and implementation. In the civil service history of the United States, Ohio's connection and involvement is significant. Originally, government jobs were held at the pleasure of the president and a person could be fired at any time. President Andrew Jackson created a spoil system to clear out officials in government who belonged to the opposing party and replace them with his own supporters as a reward for their electioneering. The spoil system meant that jobs were used to support the political parties. When Ohio-born President James A. Garfield was assassinated in 1881 by a disgruntled office seeker, the tragedy spurred a need for personnel reform for government jobs. President Jackson's approach of to the victor belong the spoils needed change. In 1882, Senator George H. Pendleton of Cincinnati, Ohio, presented a bill to Congress to eliminate the spoil system and to introduce in its place a nonpartisan civil service on the federal level. Congress adopted the bill in 1883, which became known as the Pendleton Civil Service Act. Merit-based civil service systems followed in the states and at the local level. In 
In 1912, civil service was introduced on the state and local levels in Ohio. The delegates of the Fourth Constitutional Convention agreed that the civil service system should be instituted so far as practicable, and the Civil Service Act was subsequently written and passed in 1913. The Civil Service Act was amended in 1915 to provide for an appeal to the State Civil Service Commission by those classified employees who had been reduced in pay or position, laid off, suspended, discharged, or discriminated against by the appointing officer. In 1959, House Bill 794 abolished the State Civil Service Commission and created the State Personnel Board of Review and the Office of State Personnel, which was later renamed the Department of Administrative Services. Today, the State Personnel Board of Review, or SPBR, hears appeals of employees in the classified civil service of the state, counties, and general health districts and investigates alleged violations of Ohio's civil service laws. Many of the duties performed by SPBR and the Department of Administrative Services at the state and county levels are performed at the local level by municipal and township civil service commissions. Municipal civil service commissions consist of three members appointed by the mayor of a municipality. Townships exceeding a population of 10,000 and having at least 10 full-time paid fire or police personnel may create a township civil service commission for fire and police only. All three members of a municipal civil service commission are responsible for the duties of the commission. Municipal civil service commissions are regulated by the State Personnel Board of Review, which may investigate commissioners for nonfeasance or malfeasance. SPBR also has annual reporting requirements for the commissions. Cities which have a city constitution or charter may be exempted from oversight by SPBR. The Civil Service Commission typically has jurisdiction over all classified employees in the city, city school district, and the city health district. The classified civil service is designed to provide services in an unbiased manner based on employees' technical knowledge. A municipal civil service commission operates independently of the mayor and city council to enforce the constitutional mandate of selecting and retaining public servants on the basis of their merit, fitness, good behavior, and efficiency. Not all positions are meant to be selected in this manner, however. Elected officials have the mandate to hire some positions based on loyalty or other political considerations. These are usually policymaking and or high level positions in which the most desired quality is trust and loyalty as opposed to qualification and technical skills. These positions are referred to as unclassified. Elected officials often use these positions to try to accomplish their agenda. In contrast, the classified civil service or bureaucracy is designed to not buckle under political pressure and to give every citizen equal treatment under the law. A municipal civil service commission's primary duties are to adopt and administer a classification system for the municipality's employees and to hear appeals of classified civil servants who face layoff, discipline, or discharge. Ohio Revised Code Sections 124.40 and 124.09 combine the powers held by the Director of Administrative Services and SPBR and give them to the Municipal Civil Service Commission for each city. More often than not, the HR Department of a Municipality or Appointing Authority will create position descriptions for employees so that the Municipal Civil Service Commission doesn't have to start from scratch to create a classification system. Some cities may have an integrated classification system used in most of its departments and subdivisions, while others may have a separate classification system for each department. However, the authority to approve and maintain the classification system rests with the Commission. One of the most important functions of the Municipal Civil Service Commission is to guard against political discrimination or reprisal by hearing the appeals of classified employees who feel they were wrongly laid off, disciplined, or discharged. 
classified employees have certain rights and protections granted by the civil service laws of the state of Ohio. They have a property interest in their position, which equals a right to occupy that position during good behavior and efficient service. Ohio Revised Code Section 124.321 provides that classified employees may only be laid off due to lack of work, lack of funds, reorganization for efficiency, or abolishment of positions. Classified employees may only be disciplined or discharged for specific offenses. These offenses are listed in Ohio Revised Code Section 124.34. Hearing appeals from classified employees who feel they were wrongly laid off, disciplined, or discharged is an ongoing duty for the Municipal Civil Service Commissions. A commission may hear an appeal as a panel of three, designate one member to conduct the hearing, or contract with a hearing officer. The hearing should be transcribed or recorded. If the full commission is not present for the hearing, the person conducting the hearing should write a report of the proceeding. At least a quorum or majority of the commission must vote on whether to grant an appeal or affirm or modify the decision of the appointing authority. Prior to the hearing, hold a pre-hearing conference with both parties and their representatives. At the pre-hearing conference, explain the process that will be followed, set a date for the parties to exchange documents and witness lists, and identify any additional issues that may need to be addressed prior to the hearing date. You may also want to allow the parties an opportunity to discuss a potential settlement of their dispute. The appointing authority should present its evidence first. The appointing authority must show by a preponderance of the evidence that any employment actions were taken in accordance with the law. To meet the requirements of due process, the employee or the representative must be given ample time to present evidence, give testimony, and cross-examine the appointing authority's witnesses. If a hearing begins to get out of hand, the presiding officer should order a recess and give a time to come back to the hearing. In many cases, individuals appointed to a Municipal Civil Service Commission for the first time may not have a background in human resources, significant legal experience or might not even know much about civil service in general. Most individuals are generally familiar with how businesses and other organizations work, however, and currently serving commissioners are usually happy to help new members get adjusted and learn about their duties. Reach out to commission members from nearby cities as well. SPBR can provide contact information and ask how they handle common concerns. Take advantage of training and materials offered by SPBR in person and on its website. Listen to the needs of municipal employees and operating agencies and respond accordingly. Municipal civil service commissions play an important role in providing high quality public services to the communities they serve by ensuring that employees have the skills and qualifications needed to perform their duties that personnel rules and policies are fairly and consistently applied, and that employment decisions are made according to law. As population in the metropolitan areas of the state of Ohio continues to grow, so does the need for a workforce of dedicated civil servants. Professionals in civil service positions protect, educate, provide for, and assist their fellow citizens, and work to benefit the general public every day. The primary goal of the civil service system has been, and continues to be, to ensure that appointments to government jobs at all levels are based on merit and ability as determined through a competitive process. The principles of civil service specify that the most qualified person be appointed to the job, that appointments not be based on any other factors, such as political activity or patronage, and that incumbents are protected from the political whims of elected officials. This primary purpose of civil service has remained constant throughout the various historical movements that have changed and shaped civil service over the years. Wow, Judge Gunn, as you can see, we have lots of great questions. 
Please stand by. Administrative law judges will now be answering your questions that you submitted during the presentation in live format. Well, hello, everyone. We did get a couple of great questions come through, and I will address them in order with my colleague Jeanette Gunn. Uh, the first question is, do all civil service commissions have to be held in public? Please keep in mind that our answers today are offered for educational purposes only and do not constitute individualized legal advice. Therefore, you should always consult with your commission legal counsel before adopting a course of action. In short, a best practice is to know that whenever a commission takes action, it has to do so in public. So in short, all meetings do have to have an open component. Recall also that many civil service commissions, virtually all of them consist only of three members by statute. So if two meet, that constitutes a quorum and that constitutes a meeting. So it's very, very important to make sure that all actions are done out in the open. The corollary question to that is, um, does all the talking about the case have to be out in the open? Again, this is something that should be addressed with your legal counsel. It's usually the city law director. Um, however, whenever action is taken, that must be out in the open. There are some times that executive session is permitted, but whether those reasons in the law apply to civil service commissions is something that you should specifically address to your legal counsel. The second question that we have is, um, whether uh, a person who is subject to a collective bargaining agreement um, has appeal rights before the Civil Service Commission or not. In general, most collective bargaining agreements for public employees in the state of Ohio seem to end with a final and binding arbitration that occurs through the grievance procedure. So in most cases, an employee who is a party to a collective bargaining agreement, even if they're a classified employee, will not have the ability to appeal separately to the Civil Service Commission. However, there are notable exceptions. Many times, um, due to costs and other factors, a union will come to agreement with an employer, and instead of taking cases to arbitration, they'll take discipline and layoff cases to the State Personnel Board of Review, or in some cases to a Civil Service Commission. So what is all important is what it says in that collective bargaining agreement. Our third question, Judge Gunn. Um, the third question that we have is a combination of a couple. They're both about amending or changing civil service rules. Um, how often should they be updated? How do we amend them or change them? For both of those questions, I'm going to take the easy out and I'm going to refer you to our PBR website. We have um, some presentations on the PBR website that specifically take the concepts that we've talked about today and address them in terms of administrative rules, how to go about dealing with them, when to go about dealing with them, how they all interact together. So let me walk you through how to get to the PBR website. It is pbr.ohio.gov. Along the top of the website, you'll see navigation bars. The first one is about us. If you'll click on about us, Another navigational menu will open up on the left side of your screen. The second option on that is called Media Center. If you click on Media Center, you get yet another navigational bar. The third option on that is called Conference Training Videos. There's a variety of videos that you'll see that are that were originally meant for state and county employers but you're gonna find them useful as well. There's a lot of information about HR and the law, but that specific video that I'm referring to is I think about halfway down on the screen and it's called Resources for Municipal Civil Service Commissions. Again, it's specifically about administrative rules. The presenter is Ben Albrecht. He does a fabulous job. And like I said, he's gonna walk you through hooking up the basic concepts that we covered in the video with the application for administrative rules and give you some detailed information on that. The presentation is about 30 minutes long, and the best part about it is you can watch it as many times as you need to. 
Thank you, Judge Gunn. We did have two additional questions roll in since that last question. Uh, one question is quite long, but in summary, uh, it deals with whether um, hearings can be held remotely or not. Unfortunately, I can't give you the answer you need today on that. Um, there, there, there was a time when there was a law that was in effect that definitely allowed teleconferencing, so-called Zoom meetings, as a way to conduct hearings. A lot of it depends on, number one, um, if there is a charter that speaks to it, um, if your rules speak to it, but again, you would have to solicit individualized legal advice from your legal counsel to determine whether, in fact, um, a remote meeting met all the requirements of due process and also the Sunshine Law. The last question that we have is whether in charter cities, uh, commissions are limited to the three members. Um, the answer to that is, um, unfortunately, you're going to have to make um, the, the home rule provisions do provide um, additional powers to cities that have a charter, including the civil service commissions. As a state personnel board of review, we don't really deal in that every day. And so we don't know the extent of those powers and would not want to answer that question specifically, unfortunately. And I think that concludes what we've got. I think so it does too. At this point, we'll bounce it back to our uh, esteemed leader, Mr. Casey, and have him take the meeting from there. Thank you, everyone. Back Thanks. to me because Ray and Jeanette did a great job of summarizing things and a little bit of the history. And just to reinforce a couple points, that classified versus unclassified question is an important one. And it is a little complicated because different parts of the state law might apply to different people uh, and might also reiterate that in many cases on issues that we get or civil service commission gets, the burdens on the employer to prove their case if then justify a firing. And I've had people say, well, those people in government, those bureaucrats can never be fired. And I have to tell you from 12 and a half years being chairman of this board, I probably signed many thousands of final orders that do terminate employees. But the key thing is, and part of what your job on a civil service commission as well as ours is to judge what are the facts, what are the law, have they proven the point and justified it? So those are important things and clearly pre-hearings are important too because the more you can get people focused, if you're gonna do a hearing on what's the real most important issue or issues, that's gonna make it better for everybody. And I wanna repeat, don't be shy in terms of your questions. And by the way, we're up to 267 people signed on, maybe a few locations, there's two or three people there. So we're really happy with that kind of great response. And I want to reiterate, the only bad question you can ask is the one you don't ask. So don't think it's small or unimportant, but again, don't be shy. And also those the business of charter versus non-charter, that is an important legal distinction because some charters speak in great detail to what a civil service commission or HR people can do or not do. Other cases, they're fairly silent. And of course, there's a large number of cities that do not have a charter. So next, we're gonna turn it over to a couple real life people right on the front lines, Claudia and Whitney from Westlake and Beachwood. And also Dan is gonna be on the line who's an experienced attorney to moderate. So I don't know whether to turn it over to Dan and then let him take it from there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Casey. So first of all, thank you everyone for uh, attending today. We really appreciate uh, your attendance and uh, you know we, we do all this uh, to be helpful to you all. And so as Mr. Casey said, always feel free to reach out with questions, whether that's today in the future, um, please don't hesitate to reach out. And then I also wanna say thanks to uh, Whitney and Claudia for their time today. Um, so this session is going to cover some best practices, some hot topics in civil service law, and also um, earlier in the year, our uh, RNT section sent out a survey to past attendees um, regarding things you might want to learn about, specific questions you had, things like that. So in this panel discussion, we are going to try to touch on some of the um, the majority of the most important and uh, most requested topics here. Uh, for brief background, my name is Dan Sable. I'm the Labor Relations Administrator with the State Employment Relations Board. 
Um, prior to coming to CERB, I represented um, public employers throughout Ohio of all levels and even some civil service commissions um, in litigation in an advising role. Um, and then Whitney and Claudia, would you like to briefly introduce yourselves, please? Sure, I'll, um, I'll go first. Thanks for having me here today. Um, my name is Whitney Crook. I'm the Clerk of Council for the City of Beechwood. I'm also the Civil Service Secretary here. Um, I'm a United States Navy veteran. I was active duty for eight years and moved to Ohio and got involved in municipal law and um, got involved in the Civil Service Commission here and really enjoy the work that I get to do. Great, thank you. Um, I'm Claudia Dillinger. I have been on the Westlake Civil Service Commission for about three years now. Um, I have a degree from Ohio University uh, focusing in human resource management, and I have spent most of my career in municipal human resources. So I've been a, a little bit on both sides as a commissioner, and then in some of my roles with various municipalities, I've been a civil service secretary. So um, I have dual roles when it comes to civil service. Awesome, thank you both. And one last thing I did want to note before we get started is um, part of our session is there is a quiz at the end um, that you'll all be required to take. So uh, make sure you take good notes. <laughs> Just kidding there. Um, I had to throw in a bad lawyer joke or I wouldn't be doing my job. So um, yeah, so <clears throat> again, I appreciate everyone being here. Um, we're gonna start out. Uh, I know we have some attendees today who are new members of their civil service commissions. Um, Claudia, given your experience as a Civil Service Commission member, could you please give us an overview of what to expect as Commission member, including the Commission's role, what it does, and any tips you might have? Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, I would say my experience in Westlake, we don't have a set schedule as far as meetings. We meet as needed, depending on um, testing that may be coming up, whether it's promotional or uh, new hire testing for our police and fire divisions. Um, we have met to uh, update rules or consider new rules. I would say in the last three years, given the circumstances surrounding hiring in the police, specifically the division of police, we've been looking a lot at our rules and, and amending and, and trying to make more accommodations when hiring individuals. Um, the civil service secretary tends to send out minutes prior to any meetings for us to review prior to the next meeting so that we can go ahead and approve those or have any edits done before the meeting. So typically we're having, you know, our our check in, making sure we have our quorum of two to three members. We're approving minutes from the previous meeting and then talking about any other agenda items uh, that might be relevant at that time. In Westlake, only our police and fire are considered civil service uh, employees. Uh, so those are typically the topics we're discussing. I do attend all our civil service meetings for the city of Lakewood, where I'm an HR director. And during those meetings, we do meet every month as long as there's something to discuss. So it kind of varies depending on what the expectations of each municipality are, is what I found. Um, but typically we're running through an agenda that's prepared for us well in advance since it is a public meeting. Awesome, thank you. And uh, Whitney, generally same question. We also have some civil service mission clerks and uh, secretaries here, especially those that might be new to their roles. Um, could you please take us through what to expect? Um, any tips uh, similar to the, the previous question to Claudia? Yeah, certainly. So all of those things that Claudia was talking about as a civil service member um, actually come from me as a civil service secretary. So I prepare the minutes, I prepare agendas, um, I schedule these meetings. I'm constantly on my emails and sending emails trying to get dates and times um, nailed down. As Claudia said, it's same in Beachwood with us. We police and fire are our um, civil service personnel. We've had a lot of meetings, I feel like, over the last couple of years just because of the nature of recruiting and hiring police and fire personnel right now. Um, we, I feel like we're doing a civil service test all the time, whether it's a lateral test or an entry level exam. Um, and we have also been meeting a lot to amend our civil service rules. That is another one of my 
duties as the civil service secretary. So myself and the law director, we work very closely together in reviewing those rules, getting them drafted, getting them out to the civil service commission for their review. Karen Beachwood, the Civil Service Commission will um, adopt their rules, but they also need to be adopted by our city council. So as my role as city council clerk as well, I will get them on the agenda for a city council meeting for approval once they've been approved by the Civil Service Commission. Do I have any tips? You know, I think for me, I um, I didn't have a lot or any experience actually when I took over, so I really had to dive in and do a lot of research. And um, I called around and asked a lot of people questions because I wasn't sure. Um, and I and I say always be flexible, especially when you're dealing with a um, mayor appointed residential civil service commission. You're working on their schedules. You know, not everybody's going to be available um, when you need them to be. So just be flexible. Um, I, I think that, you know, forming a relationship between the police chief and the fire chief and the civil service commission is also important to the, to the role and the, and the way that we run our civil service commission. Um, so that's really the general overview of what we do. Yeah, thanks Winnie. And <clears throat> would you mind, uh, following up just on your last point? So. Have you found any specific way of uh, things that have been helpful in kind of building that relationship with the fire chief and the police chief? Because I know a common um, concern is when maybe departments aren't, you know, doing what you as the commission need them to do or or following the rules or anything else to you. Or then, and then Claudia, have any, I guess, tips or, or thoughts on how to maximize that relationship um, and not just be another person I'm um, trying to, you know, tell them all these rules that they need to follow uh, that may or may not be received so well. Right. I, I like that question a lot. So for us, I like to invite our police and fire chiefs to our meetings. They'll um, they may sometimes bring their deputy chief and their assistant chief along. Um, we also are very lucky. We have a retired firefighter who serves on, on our civil service commission and he has a very close relationship with our fire chief. And so I think that gets us a long way. Um, I know not everybody's as lucky to have somebody that has some experience, um, such as being a firefighter or a police officer on their civil service commission. But for us, we did and it was a big benefit. So I always think that it's important to also invite them, but once they're there, kind of put the Civil Service Commission at ease and let them know that, you know, we want to work together as a team. And so any rules that we're creating or, or any policy that we have to follow, I think it's important to do it as a team and to get it across that that we're all in this to do the better, to do what's the best for the community and the and the people that we're hiring. I, I will um, piggyback off of all of Whitney's comments. Um, I would say that is all accurate. And, you know, I like to ask questions and really get to know what's going on even within the departments from both of the chiefs. You know, they, they are our eyes and ears. They're the ones who are hearing feedback, you know, even when it comes to us giving a test, you know, what is the feedback you're hearing from those individuals that took the test? There's a lot of companies out there that provide them, you know, we want to know, did they, did they like the test? Did they feel it was beneficial for them to get promoted or for an entry level? Um, they're, they're kind of our eyes and ears on the ground. So it's really important to get that feedback from them of what they're hearing or what are trends they're seeing also out there. Um, you know, I think Whitney and I both alluded to the difficulties of hiring and, and retaining and mostly police officers um, within our department. So, you know, what are trends that we're seeing or what are things that we need to be thinking about and talking about for the future of maintaining strong workforces within those divisions? Thank you both for that. I appreciate it. And just to follow up on um, points you both made, uh, especially with, you know, the biggest issue everywhere, um, whether it be municipalities, um, public private sector is, you know, recruiting and retaining uh, qualified individuals. That seems to be, you know, the biggest struggle uh, post pandemic. Um, do you have it? Do you guys have any, you know, tips from your experiences trying to do that? Um, on top of, you know, you said trying to, you know, solicit feedback um, on those that have taken it and just again, continue uh, continuing to try and amend and improve the, the processes. 
I, I'll start. Um, what we have been looking at is our lateral process, um, which I don't know how many municipalities across the state have introduced that. I know it's grown quite a bit here in Northeast Ohio, which allows us to hire other patrol officers that are a civil service employee at another municipality or, you know, maybe with the state Ohio troopers. Um, we we've been updating those rules to be more accommodating of those individuals because it seems that there may be some officers not happy where they are and looking for other opportunities. Um, so having that flexibility of bringing them on, but at the same time as a commissioner, I am a big proponent of that entry level civil service process. I think that needs to continue to exist. Um, it It's existed for, you know, as, um, was discussed earlier in the presentation for hundreds of years almost. So we that process exists for a reason and we need to maintain it. Um, so trying to have that that balance of bringing on the new officers that maybe are fresh out of an academy or have only taken a test once or one or two times, but also having some of those experienced officers that you're bringing in, it's, it's a very fine balance. And We've been working on updating rules to keep that balance, but also have a little bit more flexibility when hiring in that in that division specifically. And I'll um, I'll piggyback on that as well. For us, we have actually been looking across all of our tests, so lateral transfers, entry level, and our promotional candidates. Um, with lateral transfers specifically, we had been focused on the age limit at one point, you know, we had lowered it and we realized maybe we needed to raise it again. Um, we we thought we would get, you know, good candidates also with, but again, I was also getting those phone calls that was like, you guys, you guys have the lowest age limit around, you know, so we we went back and, and we um, reviewed that rule and we changed it back. That was the first process that we did with lateral transfers. So, so in my tenure as a, civil service secretary, that was the first time that we had taken a look at our rules when we started to implement the lateral transfer process. I was very excited about that process. It's um, quite time saving. Um, the entry level process can be a little bit drawn out, a little bit um, just clunky if you don't run it the right way. So it so it was nice to have that lateral transfer. But just like Claudia said, I'm very I think it's very important for that open that entry level um, examination process. You know, you want to encourage everybody that wants to do this job to come in and and you want to make it as easy as possible while holding them to a high standard as far as being a police officer. Um, so really, you know, those are kind of the things that we've taken a look at. We've also are taking a look at our promotional process and the way that we um, score for our promotional exams and the way that we um, do our assessment centers and our written exams for our promotional process. Thank you both for that. And I see we have um, so when you submit questions, we may cover them in no particular order. So. My apologies if uh, we jump around here. Uh, we are not ignoring your question. Um, so one, you know, kind of going back to uh, one of the questions that Jeanette and Ray received regarding the um, interrelation between collective bargaining agreements, unions, and civil service missions. I did want to note that under Ohio Revised Code 41.17.08, um, the parties to an to agreement, the employer and the union are able to exempt themselves um, from the majority of the civil service requirements if they choose to do so. However, they are not able to exempt themselves from the pre-hire examination process, eligibility lists, and uh, the original appointment requirements. So again, um, your agreement may be somewhere in the middle. Um, it may not touch on it much at all, but as uh, Range Net mentioned it generally um, is pretty spelled out um, in the collective bargaining agreement and takes um, a majority of the uh, Civil Service Commission's uh, duties off the plate other than those that that we mentioned. Um, and one question we did have for you both was whether or not um, union leadership generally attends the Civil Service Commission uh, uh, hearings. I, I can take that one first. No, the, our answer is no. We we 
we don't really have any union representation in our meetings. Um, it's the Civil Service Commission, myself, the police chief, fire chief, and the law director most of the time for us anyway. Yes, I would agree. We do not have union leadership attend meetings regularly. The only time they may get involved is if there is a promotional process and there are protests um, from any of the candidates that were taking that promotional test, but that is very far and few in between. Makes sense. Appreciate that. We have another question and it's something that commonly came up um, in the survey responses was the interrelation between school districts and civil service commissions. Um, that's one of those things where there's a lot going back and forth. And I know uh, based on folks responses that that's something that uh, that um, can potentially be problematic or at least concerning if you haven't gone through it before. Um, so just a brief overview in Ohio, there's three different categories of public school districts. There's city school districts, exempted village school districts, and local school districts. However, only city school districts are um, required, are covered under the uh, civil service statutes. Um, and also, um, like I mentioned earlier, the CBAs can exempt some of the requirements in those situations. And the Ohio Supreme Court has also held that home rule cities can exclude school district employees from civil service requ requirements completely. Um, as to, I see we have a question regarding the appeal of a school district employee to the Civil Service Commission. Um, and in my past practice, I actually defended um, a fair amount of appeals um, from those to the courts. And so generally um, um, what happens, um, depending on the individual uh, charters and rules, um, the district, you know, makes its decision. Um, it goes to the, uh, if it's appealed, it goes to the Civil Service Commission. Um, they have a, a full hearing as uh, was mentioned earlier um, by Jeanette and Ray with the record, um, everything else. Once they make that decision, um, that can be appealed to the courts uh, under the Ohio Revised Code. And then, you know, generally what will happen is whoever the statutory um, legal counsel is, generally the city law director, uh, like Ray had said earlier, um, either, you know, they would defend that or they would um, send it out to an outside firm. And then the court, uh, the Civil Service Commission has to supply the complete record to the court within a certain time frame. And then the Civil Service Commission is essentially out of the picture other than, you know, to be updated by its, um, by their legal representatives and whatever involvement they might want to have. But I do want to highlight the importance of making sure that record gets filed because the first Civil Service Commission appeal I actually handled with the court, um, you know, they said, yeah, we got it all filed. The deputy brought back this slip. We're all good. It's filed. Okay, great. We start the process. Then a month later or so, we get a um, filing from the other side saying, well, the record was never filed. And so it turned out that the uh, deputy had went to the wrong court and just basically left it in a basket. And so luckily we were able to uh, maneuver our way out of it and uh, cure that issue. But uh, that's one of those things that the full record needs to be sent to the court or it can, can create significant issues for the Civil Service Commission um, up to and including you could just lose and, and the appeal could be granted if uh, the, the commission doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Um, so that's important. You know, it sounds pretty simple, but it's something that uh, you need to be cognizant of there. And then one another thing, I know you both had mentioned either today or when we had spoken previously about some amendments you had been trying to make. Um, would you both mind taking us through what spurred those, the, the desire to make those changes and the process um, by which you did it? And I guess any other tips for folks hoping to do that because as we all know you know ideally they're updated fairly they're updated often but you know sometimes that doesn't happen so um, i know there are folks out there that might be sitting there saying oh this hasn't been updated in a long time how do we even kind of start to wrap our heads around how to do that 
Um, I'll, I can go ahead and take that one away. So what spurred us to start amending our civil service rules? I, as I mentioned earlier, recruitment and retention. We we really wanted to make sure that we were doing the best that we could to recruit candidates and to keep the to keep the officers that we had. Um, the way we went about it, you know, I, I think the law director, the first time we did the amendment, the law director kind of brought it to the Civil Service Commission and said, you know, it's been a really long time. We should probably take a look at these. We want to put in this lateral transfer process. Let's go ahead and look at these rules. So um, at the time we had the law director involved, we had a different civil service commission than what we have now, different members. Um, but I do remember the police and fire chief also being actively involved in that process. They were attending our meetings. They were talking about the things that they wanted to change. And we, um, we as a law department between myself and the law director, we made those changes, got them to the commission, um, got them reviewed, did any final, any final tweaks that we wanted to do on it, and then we got it to the um, to the city council. Um, now, again, we're we're looking at our amending our rules again. We did it at the end of last year, but we um, we had run into uh, just a few more recruiting problems whenever we had recently done our lateral transfer process. So we we kind of looked at them one last time and 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 made some more amendments and. That wasn't good enough so we went now we're back to the drawing board and we're making a few more changes some of those changes include like what i was talking about earlier is the age limit on lateral transfers we're actually changing the way that we score our civil service exams um so you know how we score give scores across the entire civil service process um and just like last time i think that I will be, I'm heavily involved in that. So as a law director and both of, and all members of our civil service commission and our police chiefs. And in the past, we have also presented to city council in a council committee meeting, these civil service rules. Um, so that way council can really see the changes that we're making. Um, and then they will, they, they'll vote on them at, at a city council meeting. So that's kind of where we are and, and what had spurred it. And I, and I, I think that that is probably going to be the answer for a lot of people. We just want to make sure we're on the cutting edge as far as getting quality candidates and, and making it a, an easy navigable process. Um, I'll, I will just comment on what Whitney shared. Our situations have been very similar. One recent rule change that uh, actually the commission ended up turning down was a request of right now when we promote someone, we have to take the top candidate off the list based on score and move through the list. There was a request made to consider promoting from the top three as openings become available and uh, we, the commission just didn't feel that the the support or the reasoning behind wanting that change was there. So we did not make that change. So, you know, I think that's something to keep in mind as a commission. You know, you have to take all parties input uh, into consideration and you know, sometimes you'll have people who probably aren't happy that you're not doing what they want, but um, you know, that's our role. That's our role is to take everything as an under an advisement and consider it and then make a decision. Um, but a rule we recently did make was for the lateral process in Westlake. Um, it's actually recently created. We didn't have one before, so we've done that. And then even since introducing the lateral process, we've updated how many laterals we're allowed to hire compared to off our entry civil service list. So that's a rule that's recently been changed. In Westlake, slightly different than Beachwood, um, another recent change was our civil service rules were codified through city council. Just recently, city council passed um, to remove that. So civil service does have pretty much full control over our rules now and are not required to go back to city council to have anything officially amended or changed. So that was a recent change for us. and. Um, it just it provides us a little more flexibility than having to make a change and wait several council meetings um, until that change is fully in effect. So it just allows us to expedite that process a little bit. Thanks. And just to clarify, um, seeing some questions, clarify a couple of earlier comments. Um, so first, individual employees in the CBA cannot opt out. Um, what I mean there is that 
if the union and the employer in their collective bargaining agreement agree to opt out the entire bargaining unit from those procedures, then they can do so, but it's not on an individual basis. Um, they can't pick and choose. And then to clarify, um, earlier Whitney and uh, Claudia didn't say that only police and fire can be in civil service. They just said that in their specific municipalities, those are the only ones um, for the per the charter. So, um, and just to, Dan, if I if I could comment on that, you know, as my as in my role in Westlake as a civil service commissioner, that is how it is. In Lakewood, we do have several positions that are civil service outside of our police and fire. So it does just vary by your rules and and what's codified, you know, or within your charter. So um, I've seen it both ways. Um, and we handle, you know, those um, non-safety personnel positions a little bit differently. And if there's questions on that, I'd be happy to go over it. But um, I've seen it done both ways. Thank you. And a couple <clears throat> general answers we can provide. Um, obviously, like Brandon had said earlier, we can provide specific legal guidance. But a couple of questions we can give you a general answer or best practices. The first one was, do cities... Um, usually have a handbook for police and fire or other employees. Um, generally speaking, from the from the employer side, you would ideally want to have a handbook or a policy manual that is passed out to employees and you know they they sign that they've received it um, because then if you you then later do um, have to go to a hearing and try to prove that um, try to uphold that discipline that was issued, um, if you, one of the factors is if they were on notice that what they were doing was um, a violation or could subject them to discipline. And if there's not a handbook, it's a little bit harder to prove that. So that again, but that's general um, and can vary. Another was, <clears throat> are civil service commission members able to speak with chiefs outside of civil service meetings without violating sunshine law? And again, <clears throat> you want to talk with your, uh, their legal counsel about that, but generally if it's one commission member um, that does not constitute a, a meeting of the public body, but when it's two or more, then there's a quorum. And so that is uh, that is not allowed and would need to follow the Open Meetings Act, uh, Open Meetings Act requirements. Um, and another, let's see, going through our topics. Have either of you seen a big difference in, <clears throat> excuse me, entry level testing versus promotional testing um, slash lateral testing and any, I guess, tips or or uh, things you've learned from from that? Uh, I would say yes. I mean, I think most municipalities are, are seeing a lot of changes in between and across all three of those tests. Um, you know, I'll never forget the first time we did a lateral exam. We said we were taking 50 candidates and they were lined up outside on my sidewalk. Um, and I had all 50 candidates within the first hour and a half of taking those laterals. Um, you know, I think the biggest tip you have, and I keep going back to this, is making sure that you have a navigable civil service process that that is it, it's easy. It, it although it holds you to a high standard, you know, you you want to move through the process as quickly as you can. Now, is that always? able to happen? No, because again, you're dealing with other people's schedules. You're dealing with the testing agency schedule, um, and it seems just like everywhere, everybody's short staffed. So sometimes you have to wait and and that can hold up your process. Um, some of the things that we see and, and one of the things that we see that that is a big factor in how quickly we can get a list certified is background checks. Now, I think that's a good thing because that means we're doing a very thorough background check on these candidates, um, but it does hold up the process a lot. But I think you don't want to compromise that. You know, you just kind of have to, you go back to what Claudia said, you're not going to make everybody happy. So you just kind of have to deal with it. But it it does make it does make it seem that you're doing a very good thorough background check on these candidates. Um, you know, I, going back to the rules, that's another thing to make sure, make sure your rules are always up to date, make sure you're doing everything that you can um, and and try to get, 
try to get your recruiting out there, try to get your members of your police force or your fire force out to these, um, you know, academies and, and schools and may have them have a presence just so that, you know, you can get the word out that you're that you're hiring and, and looking for good candidates. Yes, we um, we've seen definitely a decline in how many applicants or individuals are taking our entry level um, police tests. Our lateral process runs um, on a regular basis, so we don't we don't say, OK, you have to apply now through the end of June. Our lateral process is ongoing, so that process is a lot different where someone's just submitting an application, their OPADA certification. Um, their physical agilities test, if it ha you know if it has to be within a year, or so if they they need to submit that, um, and so once we have those materials, then we start to consider that applicant for the lateral process. We're making sure they've spent a year at another civil service agency, um, so that process is a little bit different. Where the entry level, you know, we're collecting those names, getting a list, certifying it, um, and then you know working through that list and. I would agree. I mean, the backgrounds are definitely are certainly what takes the most time, but yeah, it's a it's a necessary process. And the more th thorough we are, the better candidates we're going to have. So, you know, although it can be time consuming, it's very needed and worth the wait when it comes to having your top notch candidates. I want to I just want to say one thing about what Claudia had just said about her lateral process. So in in the beginning when we started the lateral process, it was one of those, you know, we're gonna have an application period. We are now amending our rules to have this rolling lateral process that like Claudia talked about. So I'm hopeful that that will give us quality candidates, you know, and we will be able to have them and be able to fill those spots as they become available. Um, so that is one, one of the newest changes that we're gonna be making to our rules before too much longer. And and just to piggyback off that, um, which I feel like I've said like four times today, but Whitney, you've had shared so many good things that I I love feeding off of what you're sharing. Um, you know, a lot, especially what I'm seeing in you know both of our communities being from Northeast Ohio, is we do talk to each other. We we learn what one another are doing and what's working, and say, okay, well if they're trying this, maybe we should try that too. I mean. It's unfortunate that we're all battling each other for these candidates, th these high, qu highly qualified candidates. That's the way of the world, unfortunately. But um, it's really nice that we can learn from each other and see what works, what doesn't, and then you know make our help our community to build these strong um, safety forces. So it was discussed earlier, but please reach out. You know whether it's to one of us or to another community that has some longer term commissioners. Um, because there's just so much insight and knowledge and and things that we can tell you that were great ideas and things that just weren't successful. So um, it's really important that we kind of work with one another to make sure that we're building strong workforces and retaining our employees. Two follow up questions there. So first, I have some questions regarding are there any differences between the tests that you're administering to the lateral transfers as opposed to the uh, new hires? Yes. Uh, I'll go. Oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Claudia. <laughs> okay. So we use for our entry level what we have been using for at least the last year, maybe two, is the national testing network for our police um, process. So those individuals have to log in. They have to say they want to take the the that test. Um, they submit any documentations were required and then they're taking a test and, and receiving a raw score and then you know we're letting the national testing no network know okay are closing our test on june 30th they send us the results you know we we're tailing maybe any extra credit points they receive we're making sure any documents that were required are received such as you know a driver's license um uh, a diploma anything along those lines that we would require um, so it's a very standardized process for the entry level. Our lateral process, they're filling out a, a very robust application and then attaching, you know, verifying that they work for a civil service agency because that's one of our rules. We require them to be somewhere a year 
uh, as a civil service person to be considered for our lateral. Uh, they have to have their OPATA certification. So any of those specific requirements our rules have, we make sure that they submit that documentation. And as long as they're meeting that, we'll start that process of an interview, a background check to continue that lateral individual in the process. So it is different where entry level is much more structured. It's a set timing. The lateral is kind of ongoing. And as we receive them, we process them. Um, I, I would say for us, it is a different process. It is a different test. Um, it, although, you know, you sometimes feel like you're getting a lateral officer on an entry level test just because that was the test that was open. Um, so that does happen. But for us, it's totally, it, it is a different process. Um, although we still do require a certain percentage on a written exam or other exam, um, we also will require a civil service interview. One of the things that we're eliminating is chief's points. So we, up until this point, we have always offered scoring on chief's points. That will be going away for entry level exams and for lateral exams. We're still keeping it for a promotional. Um, we have a written exam for our entry level test, and then we do an online um, web-based, scenario-based exam for our lateral officers. And we have a requirement that when you're a lateral officer, you must be working for another civil service agency for two years. So those are kind of the, those are kind of the requirements for us as far as lateral and entry level. Thank you both. And I'm going to run through quick and kind of just touch on briefly some, some other questions that we've had. So one, um, being tips on responding to requests for accommodations and testing. Um, first, again, you know, it's not a fun answer, but talk to your uh, statutory legal counsel um, and make sure you're complying with the ADA and any other applicable local, state, or federal laws. And then also, revised code 124.231 um, requires that special examinations be administered for those who are legally blind or legally uh, legally deaf. Um, and that segues into my next, the next question as well. Um, we had a question regarding how to try to distinguish um, or make sure there's no, you know, um, discrimination happening throughout the process, um, you know, uh, whether that be race, race-based, sex-based, um, any gender, anything else. Um, generally speaking, what, uh, what Claudia and Whitney touched on already was just you need to make sure you're following and um, administering your rules fairly. Um, you know, the classic scenario is oh, so-and-so knows so-and-so, so we kind of give him a, a break or whatever, which obviously you, you know, shouldn't be doing, but um, the best way to, you know, make sure you're protecting yourselves from that, both to be fair to the applicants and, you know, to protect yourself in the, the commission is to just, you know, administer and apply all the rules fairly. Um, another one has some questions about the ability of civil service commissions um, to amend their policies or um, make different ones. And generally speaking, um, the, the revised code provides a broad, uh, broad ability for those commissions to make any specific changes they might want to do as long as they are still, um, you know, following the, the general provisions of the revised code and not violating any other law um, or things of that nature. Let me make sure I'm hitting everything else. And then just um, briefly, the, the revised code uh, 124.41 and 42 provide the minimum requirements for police and fire. Uh, generally for fire, it's 18 years or older. Um, if it's an original appointment, they must be 40 years of age or younger, and they must have 120 days prior to the appointment, must have passed a physical, and um, the appointing authority must submit that to uh, the Ohio Police and Fire Pension Fund. Um, generally, those same things apply to police, except that the age requirement is 21 years of age. Um, however, the commissions are able to establish a police cadet program for those that are 18 to 20 um, years of age. And the max age for original appointment for police um, is 34 years or younger, and they have the same filing requirements. And with that, I um, just want to give you, you both the floor briefly if you have any final comments or thoughts and just want to say thanks again for uh, 
your participation in this and um, feel and those who have been attending, thank you as well and feel free to reach out with uh, any questions you might have. I, I just want to say thanks again for inviting me. I really enjoyed being here today and answering your questions. Please, you know, reach out to me. I'm, I'm happy to talk to any, you know, surrounding area or any civil service secretary and, and, and expound on any of these topics. Likewise, thank you so much for having me. And, uh, you know, I want to I want to share. I've been doing this a while and I learned new things today. So it's, <laughs> things are ever changing. And, and I think we uh, we always learn something new uh, no matter how long we've been doing it. So uh, thank you for educating me a little bit today, too. And uh, good luck to everybody. Thank you both. And with that, I'll turn it back over to uh, Mr. Casey. So to all three of you did an excellent job. And I think it makes the point of things are very different. If two suburbs in Cuyahoga County can have different circumstances, imagine as you go over the 88 counties. So there's a lot of variety. There's a lot of differences, a lot of changes that are there. And if you don't mind, let me put in a little commercial plug. We're not afternoon TV and the soap operas, but our little mini commercial is that coming up August 10th, SPBR will have a statewide in-person conference in Columbus dealing with a wider range of issues. And to give you a little preview of what will be sent out shortly is among the speakers, uh, like one of the areas that we used to call social media, still kind of is, but I think it's gonna be titled TikTok to Meta, what's changing and things always are changing. The two of our speakers, one is the general counsel, not of the state FOP, but the national FOP, who's very experienced in this area. And then the other person on just that one area is the author of the book, the law book that deals with civil service in Ohio. Also the state DAS director will be a part of our program and have some of the staff in dealing with some of the changing HR issues. Because as you talked about on police especially, there's a lot of things that are different, recruiting, retaining, those are all important issues. And also want to put a plug in from past programs we've done, you can look on the SPBR website and you can access those videos. And uh, if what's on TV this summer is not very exciting, I can't say that we have much drama like on Law & Order, but uh, there's a lot of different things that you could look at, learn, go back at. And next I wanna turn the program over to Jim Sprague. Jim's been around at SPBR, hate to tell this, but over 30 years, including the last Twelve and a half years putting up with me, but Jim is a very experienced lawyer. He's our chief administrative law judge, so he's the boss over Ray and Jeanette and keeping them on their toes, and they keep him on his toes. But Jim also was a clerk for a Supreme Court justice that I knew and worked with, so his legal history goes back a long time. He follows very closely what the legislature is looking at, what court decisions come down from Court of Appeals districts, judges at the common pleas level or even at the state Supreme Court. We had a recent case that went through there where the Supreme Court decided. So I'm now happy to turn it over to Jim Sprague. And since we're low budget, I'm gonna to have to swing the camera around. We don't have quite as many cameras and right here's Jim live in person. Thank you, Mr. Casey. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jim Sprague. Thanks for that great introduction. Uh, when they told me I was doing uh, cleanup for batting, I'm like, oh, last person of the day, people are going to be tired. And they're like, but it's on civil service testing. So then I felt really much better about it because that's an exciting topic. So uh, let me uh, start off by just noting that, uh, as we've reiterated a couple of times uh, with uh, Ray and Dan and Jeanette, uh, we can offer you uh, procedural assistance and can get into I mean, some of the, uh, I guess I'd say some of the weeds and the meat in your questions. But remember, we aren't your legal counsel. Uh, you have statutory or uh, appointed counsel with your municipalities. And please, if you've got a question, you know, ask them. We always tell people to do that because they're the ones to advise you on that. And if uh, you get sued, they're the ones who will defend you. So they're the ones who need to know about that. Okay, so let's just start out with a little bit of history real quick. I won't go back as far as Jeanette and Ray, but uh, we'll go back to uh, 1912. Uh, people of Ohio uh, did uh, enshrine uh, competitive examinations in uh, the revised code uh, and uh, actually in the Ohio Constitution in Article 15, Section 10. Uh, and uh, basically for statutory cities in particular, competitive testing of classified positions is required under most circumstances. So let's 
keep that in mind. Um, revised Code Section 124.23 covers examinations and gives us a little bit of background as to uh, who should be tested and what should be tested. Uh, basically, as I indicated, uh, the Civil Service Commission probably should be testing for most city positions, particularly for uh, statutory communities. Um, we're having issues here. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Speak up. Any louder? Louder. Louder. Okay, I can do that. All right. Um, Justin says they have to be louder. So some exceptions in the code who, uh, for folks who don't have to be tested, are unclassified employees, uh, professional employees, certified employees, day laborers, and other places that are practical to test, or we have peculiar and exceptional qualifications. Uh, that don't have to be tested, and we'll cover those in a few minutes. Uh, 124.23D covers examinations, and there's all sorts of ways to test. Uh, an important thing to remember is uh, anytime you make a selection going one way or the other, uh, that is considered a test. Anytime there's a cut point, uh, anytime there's a selection, please consider that a test. There's all sorts of ways that we can test now. It's not just uh, pencil and scanning sheets. We have physical fitness tests, agility tests, psychological testing for certain safety positions, panel interviews, uh, all sorts of different ways. Uh, it's important to remember that you provide consistency in your testing. Uh, you want to have reliability and validity concerns put away. You need to give the same test in the same circumstances uh, under the same testing conditions for all your employees. That way you can help uh, avoid a challenge and give everybody an assurance that everything is fair and equitable. Um, as was, um, I think Dan indicated a few minutes ago, we also want to make sure that there's non-discrimination in your testing. Uh, at, your testing instruments need to be narrowly tailored to the particularities of the position and the specifics of the position. And obviously, you need to comply with all pertinent EEO and ADA requirements. Um, testing instruments, as I said, do need to be uniform. You only use the same methods for testing all your folks, uh, and you need to test essential job duties that are relevant to the position to be filled, uh, all testing, and that includes physical fitness testing, drug testing, and psychological testing uh, must be directly tied to the duties. Um, if there's particular requirements uh, that need to be fulfilled, you need to tie those in as well, but don't exceed those. Those would include federal and state certification requirements, such as for the United States Department of Transportation, uh, commercial driver's licenses, or uh, OPOTA requirements, police and fire. Um, uh, for your interview questions, again, they, they need to directly relate to the job duties that are expected to be performed. We try to avoid questions, and you shouldn't be asking them on. Preferred qualifications, we'll put that in quotes, uh, personal beliefs, spouse, partner, children, marital status, gender or prior pay questions. Those may be interesting, but they're not your business when it comes to interviews and testing. Uh, for veterans' preferences, and I will say initially on that, that is kind of complicated, so I'm not going to get into too many details on that. Uh, if you've got questions on it, you can always ask us, but it's important to remember that you can add 20% on for honorably discharged veterans who have served at least 180 days. And there's a 15% add-on for National Guard. Uh, we need to remember that those add-ons are only to be utilized after the applicant has passed the initial exam, uh, but they do need to be then included before you do your rank ordering on your list. Uh, also, um, if you need a DD-214, which is a um, Department of Defense form for honorable discharge or other discharge, um, then you can get that hopefully from the applicant, but it may be necessary to get that from somebody else. Also, um, if you've got somebody in the Guard or somebody who's still in active duty, it may be that a DD-214 cannot be issued yet at that point. Uh, what we suggest then is as soon as you know that, uh, you uh, may wish to contact that applicant's commanding officer to see if you can get a notification of good standing and active duty. Uh, and that usually takes some time because there's just a process to it and usually commanding officers are pretty busy folks. So the earlier you can get to that, the better to help try to maintain your statutory timeline for testing and eligibility lists. Um, the uh, list is basically the, the top 10, or uh, <clears throat> eligibility list duration 
is generally a year. Uh, it's you can you can jettison the list essentially if you want after the position has been filled, but you can keep it for a year. There is an exception for fire applications, and we'll go over that in a few minutes. Uh, Non-competitive selection is a kind of a tricky topic, and we're going to camp out on that one for just a few minutes if we could. Uh, that comes from Revised Code Section 124.30. Uh, there's two components. A deals with, um, with if the commission is unable to certify um, a list. Now, that's a really general provision, uh, and we can kind of cover that specifically with you. Uh, that one is still being, um, I guess I'd say, uh, flushed out even after all these years, but there may be circumstances where that is necessary. And if it is, then you can utilize non-competitive selection. The other one is much more specific. It's B, which deals with uh, peculiar and exceptional qualifications. I'll just call it that. There's three elements. Basically, the position itself requires uh, peculiar uh, exceptional qualifications that are not the ones that you would ordinarily expect for the position. Uh, there needs to be a situation presented where competition itself is impracticable. And then finally, your candidate or candidates who are uh, being considered have to have um, high and recognized attainments in particular fields that are relevant to the position at issue. Those are very difficult conditions to fulfill. Uh, most of the time, uh, you're not going to have that situation, but it is possible and it is there as an option. Uh, I, we would probably say that it's exceptional circumstances and should only be used exceedingly sparingly. Um, if you have a situation where you think the Civil Service Commission might need to employ uh, 12430B and not and utilize the non-selective uh, testing and competition, then um, you might want to give us a call for additional procedural assistance. And we certainly suggest that you call your legal counsel on that because it's in that situation, it's better to uh, ask permission than to ask for forgiveness later because you might have to unwind your appointment and that's, uh, that's messy at a minimum and you might end up with some legal issues. As I said, there may be situations where it does apply, but um, you know, it needs to be used exceedingly sparingly. So when can uh, a provisional appointment become permanent? Well, there's two situations. Uh, when the occupant uh, successfully completes a probationary period of six months or longer, or if there's a successfully occupied the position for six months, whichever is longer, and that's a little bit of complicated. But um, basically, why do we care about that? Because once somebody has a permanent appointment, they have achieved the highest level of classified civil service due process protection, and it's particularly relevant when you're considering layoffs and the order of layoff. Those folks would be the ones who would be at the very top of the list, or uh, they'd be like the last ones who might potentially be laid off. So uh, we talked a little bit about police and fire earlier, um, and we'll spend some time on that. Those are very specific appointments and application processes. Uh, so if you have questions on those, um, you can always call us and we can provide you with assistance on those. Again, you can always seek legal counsel as well. Uh, they, uh, the code does provide for a number of exceptions for police and fire that aren't pertinent to other employees. Um, 124.41 deals with uh, uh, basically the police minimum requirements, the physical requirements, uh, and some of the testing. Uh, 124.42 is the fire requirements, um, and so you would probably want to check those out, obviously. Those can be to some degree amended in a charter. But uh, as I said, unless it's specific and that authority is there, then those need to be um, followed. Uh, police and fire have different promotional requirements than other uh, civil service application positions. Uh, Dan, I think, covered a little bit of that. Uh, like, uh, basically, uh, there we are. <laughs> okay, as you can see, uh, there's a the patrol officers can be promoted after 12 months. Uh, for firefighters, it's, it's a longer period of time. Uh, you obviously have to have t at least two applicants for an exam uh, and uh, some other requirements there. Uh, so as I said, those are very specific and we'll be happy to uh, you know talk to you about those as needed. Uh, if you look at uh, 124.46, 
It does talk about fire um, eligibility list. That's a point where there is a difference uh, in that, uh, if you'll notice in that left-hand column, uh, the list can run for up to two years instead of up to one year. So the commissions have a little bit of latitude there uh, and the requirements are just a little bit different. Uh, there's a 10 day requirement for appointment for fire vacancies. So again, we suggest, you know, hang on to those uh, PowerPoint printouts, but uh, keep an eye on that stuff. All right, so uh, what happens if um, you have a, a fire promotional situation and your list is expired? Well, basically the appointing authority, and that's what AA is on there, uh, needs to notify the commission the commission will need to hold an examination. They'll have to establish a list, and then they will certify the highest ranking name to the appointing authority, who will then appoint that individual within 10 days thereafter. So uh, that's a situation where it's, again, timing is very important uh, because you've only got 10 days to do that, uh, and there's just a 60-day period before that. Uh, so we've got, uh, we have answers, and we do have some questions that were uh, quite a few. And we kind of uh, cherry pick those a little bit. Uh, so Justin, are you gonna, let, well, first, before we do that, uh, I will note that um, PBI's general phone number, and it is in the materials there, is 614-466-7046. We take civil service questions all the time. We're always happy to do that. As we say, we monitor and assist the commissions. There's about 280 commissions out there and we get calls all the time and we're happy to do that. That's part of our mission. So please feel free to contact us. And we also have the PBR website listed on there at pbr.ohio.gov. So are we going to then? Go ahead and review them and okay. answer them as needed. All right. Let me, while, while Jim is looking at some of those questions, let me just give a little background. The great news is we've had lots and lots of questions and that's wonderful. And we appreciate your patience. We're still over 200 people online, which is super. But uh, even though we're scheduled to, to end very shortly, the good news is we'll t spend as much time as we've got questions. And uh, so if you haven't asked a question, still want to, that's great. And if you've got to move on to something else in your day, we understand that totally. But the bottom line is we'll stay as long as we've got good questions that you want to ask. And Jim gave you the number. Uh, feel free to follow up and ask more. So I'm going to Turn it back to Jim as he looks through some of the questions, okay. and uh, we'll rotate the camera back. Thank you. Here's our, I'm sure they'd rather see you than me. No. <laughs> Here's our first question. Okay. Uh, would a discipline party need to approach the Civil Service Commission to appeal discipline? Discipline issues have never been brought to the Civil Service Commission here. They're usually dealt with by the unions. All right, so let's start with the basics. Um, all right, so let's assume the question we're going to direct it at statutory cities initially. Uh, the Civil Service Commission would be a place where a discipline employee, if the discipline is at a certain level, let's say a removal, uh, just for a hypothetical, uh, that would be the place where the city employee would and should appeal in the first instance. And the commission should then take that issue up. Um, we're not really sure why the appeal hasn't been brought there. It may be that just the employees never brought it. Uh, maybe they didn't know they were supposed to bring it there. The city really should tell them when they give them the discipline that that's an option. It, um, also, unclassified employees generally would not, the commission would not have jurisdiction over them. So it may be that those are the folks who've been disciplined. Now, uh, it also says they, they're usually dealt with by the union. Now, of course, the collective bargaining agreement can supersede the civil service law. Um, as we've indicated earlier, uh, agreements in Ohio do have uh, grievance procedures built into them. Uh, a lot of times those go to arbitration as well. Some, uh, if the agreement basically covers discipline uh, and there's a, a arbitration procedure built into the agreement, then those would be taken out of PBR's jurisdiction. However, if the agreement is silent on discipline or if there's an election provision where the employee can either grieve or the union can grieve on behalf of the employee, or they can come to SPBR and that, um, or the commission. That would be another place where the commission could take the appeal. So there's certainly situations where the commission would need to take it. Now, it may be, as we've said, none of those conditions is present in this case. Uh, it may be that the collective bargaining agreements are quite extensive and they cover most of the employees in the city. And so that just hasn't arisen. 
But if circumstances do arise where there's a classified employee uh, who would fall under the uh, civil service provisions, then the first avenue of appeal would be to the Civil Service Commission for discipline at a certain level. Okay, let's try our second one. Uh, let's see. Um, I've worked in a few different cities, and it seems like the entity's civil service rules and procedures are different. The cities have the authority to give civil service certain authority as long as it complies with the ORC. Uh, yes, they do. Now, uh, most of the authority uh, that civil service commissions have obviously is set in the revised code. Uh, a fair amount is contained within RC 12440, but I think as Jeanette indicated earlier, uh, basically the commission assumes many of the roles that SPBR has at the municipal level. So, uh, got my question again. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, basically, the, the commission uh, can. There's a couple of ways you can look at this. Uh, one is that the commission's authority is set statutorily. In that case, the city really can't give them too much more authority than they have. They can um, provide the commission uh, kind of specific authority over certain pieces. The commission is supposed to write rules as well that clarify its authority. Now, if it's a home rule municipality, obviously the uh, uh, electors can provide for civil service provisions, and then the council can provide particular authority or specificity to the commission under those circumstances. So if it's a statutory city generally, uh, the revised code takes care of the authority that's there. If it's a home rule municipal municipality, then it's possible to enhance that authority or limit. Okay, let's see. What do we got next? Yeah. Um, okay, courts. Okay. Uh, please address appeals of a civil service decision to courts. Um, so I'm going to assume that means a decision that the commission has issued. So let's say the commission gets an appeal from a removal of a city employee. Uh, they should then consider the appeal consider if they have jurisdiction over it. Uh, let's say they do have consider that they have jurisdiction. Uh, they'll probably hold a hearing on the appeal, uh, either through a hearing officer or directly with the commission, and then they will deliberate and they will issue a final order on that appeal. Now, again, we can't give legal advice, but basically what happens is once the commission issues an order, then the employee has a, the requisite amount of time to appeal that final order to the pertinent uh, court of common pleas which would be in the jurisdiction of that city. So uh, that's generally the avenue. Uh, we call it a 2506 appeal. Uh, appeals do not come to us from the commission, uh, us being SPBR. P SPBR looks at uh, procedural issues. They look to see whether the commission itself has complied with 12440. They don't look at direct appeals of person A who's appealed to the commission. The commission has decided to, that the removal needs to be affirmed then that individual would not appeal to SPBR, but to the pertinent Court of Common Pleas. Uh, let's see. Reasonable time. Don't worry about that one. Let's see. Um, okay. Um, is a written test a requirement for entry level police or fire position? I've heard that some departments around the state have ranked candidates based on their application as opposed to giving a written exam. Um, they would need to comply with the pertinent statutory requirements to be a police officer in Ohio. Those would obviously include uh, the requisite physical requirements, uh, psychological requirements, background requirements. Uh, they'd need to uh, qualify to carry a firearm. Uh, so a lot of that testing can be done you know, before the uh, commission actually even, you know, has to take care of anything. So um, there really is testing. And so it may be that the commission doesn't need to do uh, pencil and scan sheet testing at that point because there's been sufficient testing. Now they can always put other testing in as well, including panel interviews, uh, other skills tests, field tests, things like that. So
so uh, it may be that they're they're just not even going to bother with uh, certain level testing once they complete all that other testing. But there certainly is testing for uh, regional candidates, um, even if there's not other testing that goes on specifically at the city. All right, let's see. Uh, what do we got next here? Uh, the last question that I have marked next is. I think there was one about public meetings that we didn't get, and I can probably remember that one. Okay. Um, why don't you look at all? Yes, sir. Uh, there was a question about uh, can a commission member meet with uh, the fire chief or a police chief, um, and if is or is that a violation of the open meeting provision? So we can't give you legal advice. So our, you know, our catch-all is obviously talk to counsel about that. However, uh, it's not, I guess completely uncommon that one uh, member of a, of a civil service commission might meet with police chief or fire chief. Uh, a couple of things there. Um, obviously, uh, keep very cognizant of the open meeting provisions. Remember, if the civil service commission has three members, you don't ever want two of you together, or it potentially could be considered, uh, unless it's a, just a, a chance encounter, it could be considered a meeting. So you don't want to have that happen. Uh, it's sometimes the case that uh, Commissions appoint particular members to be, I guess, a coordinator, a liaison with uh, you know, their public safety director or police or fire. So that individual might meet with them. Uh, but I would also caution you to be careful about chain of command. Uh, you know, you might want to make sure generally that it's uh, if you have a safety director, that individual is okay with that. And then sometimes, you know, the mayor is uh, not always keen on the commission reaching out and meeting uh, with individual employees who would fall into the mayor's jurisdiction. So, um, you know, you need to be a little careful with it, but I, th I think the biggest thing is you definitely don't want more than one commissioner meeting with that individual at a time because you don't want to run afoul of the open meeting as well. Let's see, anything else? Um, did you already touch on the uh, Yes, that's one we just did. That's it, okay. All right, so those are the ones we've, we've picked. Uh, there's a few we, we individually told folks that it's probably better to just give us a call because they will involve some uh, rather specific procedural assistance and probably some more details that might not be relevant to everyone else. But again, uh, you know, office is open, so to speak. Uh, give us a call. Uh, you can email us. Uh, we have a PBR helpline as well. Uh, and we, as I said, we answer questions all the time. And a lot of these get really specific and challenging. Um, also, remember, talk to your legal counsel because they can help you and they'll be the ones to have to uh, basically protect your legal position if you get sued on something. Thank you very much, Jim. You can see why he's our chief administrative law judge and has all those decades, not years, of proven experience and can get down into the minutia and the detail and that's important, and again, I think one of the key takeaways from today is that uh, different cities have different charters, different rules, different procedures. It's important to follow those. And I wanna wrap up by saying thank you first for everybody that participated. Uh, that's really important to get this kind of response and one of the nice things about the technology is so many people can tune in without needing to drive down from Ashtabula or Paulding or uh, uh, Wasion or what other parts of Ohio. And again, it will be on the website. Want to give out double, triple gold stars to Jeanette and Ray, Jim, Dan, and especially to Whitney and Claudia. Uh, and also, you haven't seen him on camera, but Justin Brown was doing the uh, details, putting things together and making the technology work, which we appreciate. And also, Tim was helping out too. But again, thanks to most to you because most all of you, particularly if you're on a civil service commission, in most cases you're a volunteer and you're uh, way underpaid, not even the minimum wage. So everybody appreciates what you do. And in these days, particularly on police and fire and the sensitivities there, it's especially important what you do. And one final plug for August 10th, you'll be getting something soon on that program and feel free to sign up because those of us, uh, uh, kind of sold out very quickly. So if you're interested in digging deeper on a wider range of HR, social media, other kind of issues, that'll be an important program to, uh, to uh, 
participate if possible. So again, thank you to everybody involved and hope this benefits. And again, don't be shy with your follow-up questions or inquiries. The staff's here to be helpful. And again, consulting your legal counsel is also very important. It's a lot easier to fix it before you make a mistake than trying to clean it up afterwards. So thank you again and have a good rest of the day. Thank you.